You're listening to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast with Mike Chappell and Dave Griffiths. Inside the Fox 59 CBS4 Podcast Studio, welcome to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast. Alongside Mike Chappell and Matt Adams, you might not remember me, but my name is Dave Griffiths, and I typically am the host of this podcast. I thought you got another job. We yeah, were somewhere else. It's quite possible. If if I if there was a uh, Colts, ra- uh, not a Colts, if there was a... Uh, a checkered flag zone podcast. That's what I would have been doing for the. Um, you love the past that two night. Months. I had my fill when I worked at the newspaper, right? And, and I truly do enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. I, I had not. I didn't have much racing experience before coming to India a decade ago. But I, you do. You dive in. You you find the good things about it, and there there's plenty of them. Um, but uh, it's it's a heck of a lot of work, as we were just referring to a second ago. And it's been it's been crazy here, and the Colts have been seemingly an afterthought in um in in a lot of our coverage. Uh, but but that's. That's the benefit of this. That's the benefit of this medium, having a podcast. We can dive into it for an hour because I know there's still tons of people out there who are who, who have a, a, a lot of interest in continuing week after week, um, even though we have to – we fit the Colts in a little bit here and there between Caitlin Clark and uh, the race and the Pacers run to the Eastern Conference Finals uh, on the air. So so good to be back here with you guys. Glad, glad to be chatting uh, with the horseshoe once again. And we can raise the five alarm fire bells, guys. Adonai Mitchell still unsigned. What 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 what's going on at Colts headquarters? It's a dire situation there. And I remind everybody that Richardson signed like two days before camp started last year. He did, you know, along with I think Blake Freeland did. So th- th- all they're all they're dealing with is tweaks to the contract, probably guaranteed money for a second round pick. And and he he was here now. He was here last week. I assume he's here th- this week. They sign waivers and they go through this. So. This is going to get again. I go back to when Bob Sanders was the last draft pick signed. Edron James missed all of training camp. We're not there. We'll never get there again. This gets done when it gets done, and it's not an issue. Right. It, it, it's not what it was, like you mentioned, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when, when the rookies had a lot more bargaining power. Um, they could literally withhold their services. And, and that's the only ve- leverage a player has. Right. And, and now when you're a veteran, you have several years experience, you can really do that. But for rookies, it's not really an option anymore because of the way the NFL yeah. Players Association has negoti- negotiated the collective bargaining agreement with the owners. Because you were getting contracts like the last one, I think, was the Sam Bradford contract, the number one yeah, overall. That, that was the straw that, that that broke the camel's back on this. Yeah. And, and, and you're getting millions of dollars poured out to rookies who've never played a down in the NFL, which is which got to the point of being ridiculous. You want to pay your first Jamarcus round picks. Russell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you pay your first round picks well, like this year, Marvin Harrison Jr., for example, fourth overall pick. He signed a deal worth $35.3 million, $22.5 million, boom, signing bonus right there. You get it right away. So, so you're still paying these first round picks a significant amount of money, but you're not – you're not crazy money. You're not really mortgaging your future, right, which it right. seemed like you had to do to take, especially a quarterback, top of the first round for a couple years there, and bet everything on it. Like if 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 you're if your number one overall pick quarterback doesn't work, that's enough damage to the franchise than just that. Then also having to add on an eighty million dollar contract right. with it for for that guy that you take. So. Uh, all, all that to say, Adonai Mitchell will be signed eventually. No need for worry. Uh, and it will be a good-sized contract as a second-round pick. Um, and, and we all st- still have to remember the Colts loved him so much, they traded back to get him. So uh, They hate when we mention that. I know I they know do. I know they do. And, and, but but that's, that's, that's the facts of life right here. They traded up for Jonathan Taylor, and they traded back for this guy. Yep. Yes, they did. Loved him so much. Traded back for, I think it was Alec Pierce, too, the, uh, the other year, two, last year, they, two they, years they, ago. They did get two fifth-round picks, from, if they I m- remember. They two fifth-round picks for, for Mitchell, and yeah. They're, and they're, they're pretty good about fifth-round picks. They, they like those fifth-round. They like them they're picks, like, They like any picks. Yes. Uh, and if we stay at wide receiver and signing and uh, all that jazz, uh, the Texans have signed wide receiver Nico Collins to an extension. The former Michigan man adds three years to his contract, $72.75 million with $52 million guaranteed. Collins last year had a tremendous year and really a breakout year. In 2022, two years ago when the Texans were poopy, we'll just leave it at that, and the only team they could beat or tie was the Colts, it seemed like. Yeah. 
Uh, they, third, he was a third round pick. Yeah, he had 37, 21. 37 catches two years ago for a 481 yards and two touchdowns in 10 games. He finished the season on IR he as did. well. Yeah. Last year with CJ Stroud, the, the savior of the Space City down there, 80 catches for nearly 1,300 yards and uh, eight touchdowns in 15 games with a long of 75 that Matt notes uh, we remember uh, not fondly. Was here. that their first snap? Of the game, it might have been. It was. It might have been. Yeah, it was the first. Yeah, it was right the first after the It sure seems story. like it. That's yeah. for sure. The, it, Colts, it, the Colts worked and worked to get a field goal, didn't yeah. they? Field yeah. goal, and then I and think then it boop. was Collins over yeah. the top. See ya. Goodbye. Seventy-five. Bye bye. Yeah. Nice. But anyway, uh, Collins is uh, now very similar to Michael Pittman Jr.'s contract that he signed earlier this yes. year. Yes. And Pittman, so hang on, sorry, what was I saying? Te- uh, Collins was uh, 24 point and a quarter a, a year. Pittman is uh, 23, 23 and a third three. a year is, is what it comes down to for his uh, three-year extension Didn't as well. get quite, he, Pitt, uh, Collins got a bit more guaranteed. Mm-hmm. I thought Pitt's guarantee was $40 million, Yeah, I roughly. think so. So and you, you compare and contrast these contracts. The Texans love Nico Collins. They have every reason to. The Colts love Michael Pittman Jr. They have every reason to, chap. And, and the more wide receiver contracts come out, the more I think the Colts uh, can, can feel good about uh, getting Pittman his deal done when they did for the amount that they did. We said, I said at the time that it was win-win. The Colts paid good money, not great money, but good money for their top receiver. What, again, we said 233 40 million guaranteed, roughly, I think it is, but it's three years, which is good for both sides. Let's say it doesn't work well in three years, you know, you walk away, but it, it gives Pittman a chance at he's 26 at age 29 or 30 to hit the market again. And if he keeps going up, he's had 88, 99, 109 catches the last three years, he'll, he'll hit it again. So, yeah, it, it's a good deal. And what's really funny is, is the, the money he's made in his career with this contract he's going to quickly exceed marvin harrison and reggie wayne <laughs> so life is about timing when do you when, when, when is it your time mm-hmm. and right now with these receivers who's still out there uh, justin jefferson yep oh that's going to be massive jamar chase good heavens uh cd lamb yep All i mean i mean the the the, the baseline is going to be 30 million mm-hmm I think who the who the leader is who's uh, AJ Brown. AJ Brown is the biggest contract yet. Yeah, right, right now, that Nico range. Collins is seventh at twenty four and change, and Pittman has been pushed back to twenty three to tenth. Mm-hmm. So, but but it's just it's just a really it's a good contract. It pays their best. I won't say best offensive player, best receiver without question. Good money. Would he have gotten more on the market? I don't know. I think this feels like a really really good market value for him. We were talking before air that Pro Football Focus, I think it has had their top 30. I think they went top 30 or top 32 uh, wide receivers. And, and what I saw, Pitt was 25, which I think is low. He's I've always thought 13, 14, 15. Yeah, I, th- I always thought top 15. For, but they included for receiver. They included rookies. rookies. They got Marvin Harrison like 11th. Boo. I mean, come on, he's got to he's say play it down first. You've right? got as many catches as he does. I do. So, Maybe I should be 12th. But I tell you, right behind him, right I'm shifty in the slot, right? <laughs> slot guy for sure. That's you, right. Yeah. You, you would learn to go down like his dad did oh, to I would avoid go, the yes. hits. <laughs> so, so, but, but again, it, the, the receiver market is crazy. You know, it's it's receiver. Well, it's quarterback. It's almost receiver, and then pass rusher. Mm-hmm. Although, I'd rather have, I'd rather invest in a right. stud pass rusher yeah. than, a, than a receiver, but. Uh, it, it's crazy how the receiver market has exploded, and that doesn't include three of the top, gosh, six receivers mm-hmm. in the league. Mm-hmm. And and if if the trends continue to hold, the wide receiver market continues to go up. I mean, why there, would it go down? Exactly. You, you think why? Um, I, I I you you never expect like things don't change that quickly. I guess is what I'm trying trying to say. Things change much more slowly. There was a time when running back contracts were huge and it was Ladanian Tomlinson, you know, it was priest Holmes. It was Sean Alexander, those guys getting the biggest contracts, but it wasn't just a period of three years when all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, Le'Veon Bell is now holding out. Uh, that, that took like 
10 years, you know, to get there. So even if there is a change in wide receiver contracts, it's not going to happen in the next three years when Pittman and Collins here are up for another contract. So like you said, Chap, it's a, it's a great deal for Pitt because he gets to renegotiate himself uh, after being uh, hopefully uh, here for the next three years, uh, catching passes on a consistent basis, uninjured. From with, the same guy. From a same guy who has a much stronger arm than the last couple guys here. Heck, maybe every quarterback who's ever played here in Indianapolis. Back to Jeff George. We'll, we'll, at, least, we'll at least go back arm that Arm strength, far. yes. Exactly. So a guy who can get it deep, get it far, and let Pittman go and run and get some more of those yards, some more of those we, touchdowns. We will find out, I think, this year is – has the first has the the first four years been who Pittman is? Is he ten point nine a game? Right. Or or have have can the, he do twelve? Right. Can he get to twelve? Right. And is it been him? Is this who he is? Or has the has the team and their litany of quarterbacks held him back? I, I tend to think the quarterbacks have held him back, and mm-hmm. we just haven't seen that part of his game. We did see a little bit of it, to be fair, but but we don't need to get into that. We, we don't well, need one, to get into One quarterback in particular. You know what? Actually, somebody texted me today, literally just today. I'm going to show you guys as I explain it to our to – Are our, you going to mention the name uh, or probably not? Uh, no, I won't, I won't say who texted this. I mean the this. QB. But, yes, I, I will mention the, the QB. Um, the Carson Wentz, right now, if you are a fan of Carson Wentz and the Indianapolis Colts, his jersey is on sale on Fanatics right now for $24.99. Did you hit buy? I have not hit buy, a- no. to my cart? Uh, I have not. But uh, somebody texted me that and said, good day for Dave, in a <laughs> good, good joking fashion. So if you are... There have been times at Pittman, when he talks about his career, he mentions that year. Exactly. He does, because he yes, knows. he does. Because he knows that year, with that quarterback, with that arm, he had a good, strong connection. Because it was kind of like, go wrong and I'll, you know, because yep. he had bigger plays, but he also had four or five DPIs. And, and that's something that Frank Reich talked about, and, and the Colts in general, but especially head coach Frank Reich when he was here, when the Colts drafted Pittman, was his ability to go up and get 50-50 balls, that that was an elite trait that he had is one of the main reasons that he liked him among that entire class of wide receivers that came out in 2020 that he was frank's guy really in that class so um so yeah all that to say um this is a big year for Pitt, and obviously a huge next three years for him uh, in terms of his future and that uh contracts uh, also could be uh the benefit of an 18 game season by that and heck in three years it could be a 20 game season the more they keep uh keep pushing for it but not probably not but uh but it might be an 18 game season by then um OTAs are back uh, at Colts headquarters right now. The team will hold a mandatory mini camp from June 4th through June 6th. Um, we've had open practice. We've talked to Shane Steichen. We've talked to a bunch of players. Um, everybody is back in the best shape of their lives. Everybody is back rehabbing. Feeling, uh, at feeling the best, great. Feeling great. Uh, Adonai Mitchell is there with a smile on his face all the time. There's absolutely no need to be concerned about those uh, anonymous reports from from the, the pre-draft process, which the Colts say that they're obviously not concerned with anyway. But but all that to say, Chap, th- this is the time of year where where uh, we're think- everybody's gung-ho and everybody's thinking positive. Nobody has hit any type of uh, adversity yet. So, so a- every thing that comes out of Colts headquarters is is on the up and up right now which is what you want you're not having your kicker saying things or or being accused of things like a couple teams have to deal with now and this team's had to deal with those things in the past we hadn't gotten to the Isaiah Rogers gambling that was in mid-June that was later yeah because we had just done like the last interviews we could do but we but we were in, in the in the early stages or mid stages of the Jonathan Taylor saga, right? I mean, with, we've had Kenny Moore before asking about correct. the contract. We've had correct. a little bit of that, yeah. So, so there's that. That's and that's what you want. You want you want quiet. You want, I guess, boring if that's the word you want. I wrote about today with Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson. They need they need to be together in practice. They they had virtually none last year. Uh, they had two two reps together in a game. And I tried to remember. I think they only had three practices leading up to the Tennessee game because I don't think JT practiced the first four weeks. I don't think. So everything that – and so much of what this team will be, well, it hinges on, yes, Richardson, he has to be C.J. Stroud-like. I mean, he doesn't have to throw put those numbers up, but I don't think he will in this offense. 
but Jonathan Taylor is 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 one A. He's one A. He's he's got to be the guy that that I, I remember in Peyton Manning's rookie season that he called Marshall Falk his security blanket, mm-hmm. which is not a bad security blanket. Right. So pretty good one, Hall of Famer. So keep, let's keep in mind that Richardson has played, has started four games, thrown eighty four passes, and taken one hundred seventy three snaps. So every every practice that he and Taylor and Pittman and Pierce and AD and all of these guys, it's invaluable. It will lead it will lead toward what has to happen in September. And it's all voluntary at this point. But for the most part, they've all been there. Right, exactly. But that leads us into uh, another discussion that has been a little bit of the talk of the NFL for uh, for the past couple days, as uh, NFL Network's Tom Pelissero tweeted out. That the NFLPA, at least, is considering uh, a proposal to overhaul the offseason program for NFL teams. That would start, certainly not this year, it would start at the earliest next year. And what it would do is eliminate OTAs, not OTAs, no, no in favor of a longer training camp ramp-up period. So, uh, obviously, those of us who have followed the NFL for a long time, chap, uh, and and, I'm, and me and, and Matt, all of us uh, remember the old days where uh, there were two a days of uh, of training camp practices, and water was for the week, and uh, <laughs> and all that. Um, they, we, they've come a long way since then, uh, but the the training training camp currently does have a short ramp up period of just a couple practices until you can put on full pads and actually hit, um, but. That it, it's an interesting framework for for this new proposal. Um, the camp ramp up would be kind of mid June or early July, and that would give players a much longer break from the end of the season, uh, where where currently teams really can't talk to players about football related things from the end of the season and exit interviews to when they return in early mid April, whenever that is for right. for the first stage of the off-season program which is just strength and conditioning work rehab work and um in classroom work that's what i was thinking so so there we we were getting into this a bit before the podcast and then we, we had to put the kibosh on it because we kept talking and, and you're like oh, oh maybe we, we, maybe we, yeah. this should wait for the show exactly right? Let, let's wait for the show like it, it seems to me chap that that there are both positives and negatives to this to this plan and uh, if if the nfl if the owners want it, it's going to happen. That, no that's, question. Yeah, that's, that's what we have seen in the past, and that's why we're at a 17-game season now. It's why an 18-game season is coming, and it could be a 20-game 20 20 season in the next 10 or 15 years. But, uh, but I, I don't know. I think it seems like for players, you, you like the longer off period, but for teams, I think you want a little bit more – you want – players in your building more they, you want them to be there and you don't want to give them month that many months off at, at the same time I don't know we, we can get into it a little bit more now yeah it's really interesting I, I would think players like it the way it is yeah it, that would be yeah sorry because you, again you, your season's over in generally mid January unless you know you're on that run and then you're you're off until mid-April although Players, what they I'm telling you what they do, they'll take a week or 10 days off, and then they're back. They're working themselves. They're working themselves because, yeah. because that's who they are. And you have to. And, you know, this isn't back in the day when you come in and camp and you're totally out of shape because you, cause you had a second job to do. These guys, the, the ones who are true true parts of your team, they, they come in in April, and they're, right, and, and they're in good shape. So do would players prefer – and if they get rid of off-season programs and the first contact or the first on-field stuff is in mid-June, are they totally off? Do they have some two- or three-week period where teams can have COVID-like connection with players where, where you do have positional Zoom meetings or whatever? I don't know. I would think at my core, I think players – like it the way it is to where they come in and it is voluntary if you don't want to do it you don't do it you know and and, and if you're a really good player and you don't do it there's no you know repercussion i, I remember edgerton james working out as you know he, he's here when he had to be here but you know it's i went to college for a year and a half but i know what the term 
voluntary means. <laughs> so, but w- would would players be willing to give up nine weeks of largely voluntary work with the team? Th- you know, three days of mandatory mini camp and all that, the rookie mini camp, and 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 add another, gosh, month, six weeks in mid June of mandatory work in the heat. Yeah, I just I just think that players. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. I think players don't mind the way it is. Right. And it's crazy to me that an NFL that is everything is working. It's it's popular and it's working. They're they're, they're considering these changes. I I think this from the NFL is a, is a trial balloon to see reaction. And this comes. I don't know, a week, 10 days after Goodell mentioned the 18-game season. Mm-hmm. So trust me, we're going to have 18 games uh, next – probably not next year, but in a couple of years, yeah. it's going to happen. Within five years. They won it. Oh, and Easily. I, and I take the under. Yeah. But I know what you're saying. And if they're going to get 18 games, they're going to give. You have to give something significant to the players. You know, Yes, they're going to get – extra paychecks, probably two extra paychecks because if you, if you go to 18 games, you're probably going to add another week. For another week another of week, yeah. So that's just one 20-game season. Right. Is that, and that's not, that's not what I would say the players are getting. They're going to get something. No, because the owners get something with that oh, too. They get, they get more right. money themselves. So, so it, there, it, and, and is this, say, well, if you're talking 18 games and we're talking, we're going to revamp the off season and you get more of a break at the beginning. Right. And I think an 18 game season would, would also result in larger rosters. Mm-hmm. Certainly because you have to, you have to plan for more injuries. And that's what's so crazy is this league is all about safety. Yeah. But we're going to play every day yeah. of the week at some point, we're going to play 18 games. And so, so just, yes, I understand safety, but you do that. And then you're saying we're going to add games. So it doesn't, it's not, continually what you're trying to the, mm-hmm. the message you're pushing but if they won 18 games there's gonna be 18 games yeah and, and my my first reaction to this matt was just a little like I, I was a little confused that the players would would want this like i i think that there there are benefits like like we were saying to like those months that you really don't have to be there but that could also be a bad thing for guys who are trying to rehab injuries who they can do it by themselves but they could also do it at team headquarters. So there, there could I'm be I'm sure some that would be in there yes. that, that if you're if you're coming back from an ACL or no, yeah. whatever, you're you're under the supervision of the team, right? And and you could make it. So there would be there would probably be some um, exceptions in that sense. I think there's value to um, to 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 the classroom work that that goes on right at the beginning to to kind of evaluate everything that went down. I remember like when Zaire Franklin stepped up to the microphone first of all. Uh, th- throughout this offseason talked about kind of unpacking uh, what happened last year and and the uh, some frustrations that, that that went along with that um, like that that was valuable time for, for teams that have a new head coach uh, you don't want to go months and months and months without seeing your players you want to get them in there like, more want, than more than zoom exactly and more than just zoom more than just virtual learning like you you want them to be physically in front of you and 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 getting to know them and, and doing walkthroughs like they've done in the first couple stages of OTAs so that so that you can get them into your new schemes as soon as possible as much as you possibly can at that point. So so I I just don't know who this benefits. If that's something that the owners would want to say, "Hey, we're going to give you just more time off at the beginning of the off season." The players like, "Well, well, the coaches might w- wouldn't like it. The coaches wanted to be out there all the time. Coaches and GMs would hate it. it. Exactly. Hate it. And I don't know if the players would like it either. Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting uh, proposal. And then you also think of these players also kind of being creatures of habit when it comes like when, you know, one of the things I read from J.J. Watt when the schedule comes out, the first thing teams look for is, you know, like – how many Thursday night? When are we playing on Thursday night? When are we playing on Monday night? Do we have any weird scheduling quirks like we're playing on a Saturday because 
players like their routines, so they, they like to know what they're doing, and, and, and they like that week to week. You know, like the one o'clock start times for the Colts isn't necessarily a bad thing for the team because they know every Sunday they're going to play their game at one o'clock. That's going to get you into a certain practice rhythm and stuff like that. You think about the off season for a lot of these longtime players as well. Similarly, they've they've kind of done the off season the same way. So, do you really want that to change? And then also, as Chap had mentioned, then that is a long time for you guys to be out in the heat for what is uh, essentially yeah. training camp, an extended training camp mm-hmm. uh, ramp up or, or what have you. And then you had mentioned before the show about, you know, there is some benefit to like a rookie mini camp after the yeah. draft. Yep. So do you carve in some time for that that's kind of separate for, for the other? Is is that all going to be worth it? But then again, it could be the NFLPA is looking at this as we know this 18-game season is coming. And we've got to try to carve out something for us. And maybe this is sort of the starting point Mm -hmm. for ideal situation for them. I I don't know. I'd have to talk to the players to know for sure. And and that's the benefit of uh, we're getting to talk to the players tomorrow. I'm sure this will come up, especially among among veterans, guys who's been been around the league for a while. I'd love to talk to to Buck, to Zaire, to uh, Ryan Kelly, to... to Oh, yeah, Ryan Kelly's deep in the the union. Yeah, we we can get his... Uh, as much as he wants to share about right. uh, how, how this is kind of uh, coming up and what exactly the, the benefits are or, or, or all that. So, um, so yeah, I, I like, I think it's, it's like, I, I, I don't even call it interesting. I call it weird right now. Maybe it's just that I don't understand it, but I just, I just don't think that it, it sounds that, that agreeable uh, to, to me. Uh, maybe it is, but uh, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them. Uh, but, but again, I think like we mentioned and Matt mentioned again, I think this is a, the players union saying, Okay, you you want you're you're pushing for 18 games. This is one of the things that you're going to have to address that we might want in some form or fashion. You know, I, again, I don't think there were I didn't see any specifics about y- yes, mid June ramp up period. What's that mean? Two or th- two weeks? Right. A week? You don't right. know. But th- again, what takes the place, if anything, of the off season program? Now, it will it be rookie minute? Mini camp, you really it'd be hard to have a veterans mini camp because these guys will have done nothing, right? You know, physically and all that. So it, I, I'd like to see the specifics. I don't think coaches would like it, and and take into account with the setup the way it is now, the the, the one dark period in the NFL is mid June to mid July. Mid July, yeah. when there's just nothing going on, mm-hmm. and that's when coaches get away. You know, right. and, and how does this impact? Coaches uh, all across the league, as far as how they plan their plan their time. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, I like to see specifics, but again, this is just the start of the give and take of okay, you want eighteen games, we want this, and we'll see what comes out more from this. But it's interesting. But we'll see where it goes. Yeah, we will see. We will see. Uh, Pro Football Focus has come out with a list of its top tackles. I in was the surprised. NFL. I was as well. They ranked the top 32, just like we talked earlier, the top wide receivers, and Pittman was in there near the bottom, or closer to the bottom. Uh, Braden Smith, Colts right tackle, came in 15th on this list. And left tackle, Bernard Ryman, came in 16th on this list. I thought Bernie played well last year. I thought he did too. I really did. And we talked about it uh, a couple a year ago, saying, "Hey, the better he plays, the more you have to pay him, and the better which, problem which is that a is, good, not a bad correct. problem." And exactly. it, it's starting to look like with with what he was able to accomplish last year, that it is a good problem that the Colts are going to have Chap in a year or two when his rookie contract comes up. I would rather have the problem being how I'm going to pay him sixteen, seventeen million a year, whatever it is, as opposed to who the heck is my left tackle, right? Because for a while, that was really bad. See, after that, that was reality for the, for it, the Colts for a while. It paralyzes your offense. It just does. Uh, this team went through such a great stretch with Tariq Glenn, still, in my mind, one of the most underappreciated players they've had. He made like two or three Pro Bowls. Should have made more. And he retired close to his prime. He, he, he retired after the 06 Super Bowl. And then you go to... Uh, Anthony Costanzo, who was really underappreciated. He's one of those guys that you don't know what you've got until he's gone. He was really good. Never made a Pro Bowl, which was wrong. Because you're behind some other really good guys, Correct. unfortunately, in the no, AFC. No, so no the start question. of your career, you're behind Jonathan Ogden. It's like, okay, 
oh no, I can't get into the Pro Bowl. Right. Yeah. So, and then once AC leaves, you're just you you're you're flailing away, trying to find things. You know, bringing in Eric Fisher, coming off the the Achilles, which didn't work. Right. And he could then, block. He could run block. He couldn't yeah, explode it, back into a pass. Step, and he pass told us that it, that was that was what wasn't back from his uh, yep. Achilles. And then whoever the guys were, was it Julian Davenport and the name Sam Tevy, who got injured ACL or MCL, whatever so, it was but preseason. He, he, and then they, they they throw Bernie out there against Denver on Thursday night on prime time against a good pass rush with Yeesh. no Yeesh. practice, coming off an ankle injury, and he struggled. Well, duh, as you would think. <laughs> But he got better last year. I thought he played really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it helps to have Quentin Nelson to your right. No doubt. Because he's – I haven't seen the, the, the list of, of guards. He'll be top five on the list. So, yeah, and, and Braden Smith, he was 15. They, they graded him as – and take PFF however you want the grades. I mean, I – there's some I agree with and some I don't. It sheds some, it's a tool to shed some right. light. Yeah, just right. something to talk about, right. you know, to discuss. Uh, but they said this was his best season, 2023. It was also a season that he fought that knee injury. We talked to him, was it last week? Yes. And he had the knee surgery. He wouldn't tell us what it was. In typical Braden Smith fashion. Right, but, well, but he was giving us information. I thought, <laughs> well, what some. the heck was I asked? And he said, now nah, we're not going to go there. Right. But it's enough of an injury surgery that he's not participating. Which is fine. Be ready no for worries. Be ready July, whatever that Tuesday is, the last week of July. Uh, but the fact that he's 15th and on his best season, according to PFF, on a knee that just bothered him all year. Uh, so to get him back, he's under contract for like two more years. Uh, but to have your tackles, to have your tackles in place is just amazing. And hopefully going forward, they'll have this offensive line, which played – Top five last year, probably in the league, and they, they may be top five, top certainly top ten, I think top five, to take another step with, with the increased skill players. It bodes well for this team. Yeah, uh, Ryman in particular had a uh, 81.3 pass blocking grade from PFF, which was ranked ninth among all tackles in the NFL. If your left tackle can pass block, that's, that's a huge, huge benefit for you. Um, and he also reduced his pressure rate from 6.8% his rookie year to 5.8%. That was according to, to the PFF ranking. So, hey, if you can get better, hey, bring it down another percent. Go down you're, to 4.8. You're yeah, at times, but, because, of course. Because you're, you're facing, you know. Because you play Miles Garrett or, or whoever. So. Or whoever, right. But or whoever um, the Texans have coming off the edge. Uh, Daniel Hunter. Unbelievable. And Will Anderson. And, so, yeah. so, but to hold up and, and to have your quarterback – in his mind saying my backside is not a problem you know and, and that's what bernie can give him that comfort of knowing your protection is there we will continue with our pro football focus focused podcast it you, seems you can like tell here. somebody updated their website this week exactly yeah it gave us a lot to talk about appreciate you guys um they have picked jonathan taylor as indy's bounce back player for 2024 they see taylor as getting more carries with zach moss gone which is perhaps the most obvious uh, piece of analysis of the last century. And also note, he's passed the injuries last year, passed the contract dispute. They rank him the third best running back in the NFL behind Christian McCaffrey, number one, and Derrick Henry, number two. I would which, argue Henry. You, that's number one? No, it was behind Taylor. Yeah, yeah okay. I was, oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, it, I would have th thought the same, so... Yeah, uh, Christian McCaffrey is number one, and I think there's very, very little argument behind that based on what he's done in recent years. When Jonathan Taylor's healthy and he has a decent offensive line in front of him, he's a pretty darn good running back. So 18-11 in, in 2021. The first two years he was like 5'3 and 5'5 five, five yep, per carry. Per carry. That's, that's, that's decent right there. So to, to say that he's Indy's bounce-back player, I think, is very much an obvious statement. He could be an NFL bounce-back player, uh, for, for that matter, uh, when, when you look uh, all across the league. Now, there will certainly be other guys in contention, Aaron a Rodgers and Anthony might be Richardson, or whatever, yeah, guys who were hurt from, for more of last year, who did less last year. At least Taylor did a decent amount last year um, before the – the w when he was healthy i will say so um that and that's what chap the uh that's what the colts think too like that they expect him to be better they expect him to grow 
They expect him to take snaps with Anthony Richardson and for that to be a unique dynamic. So so to call Jonathan Taylor the, the Colts bounce back player is is perhaps, like I said, a, a, an obvious choice, but it is one that the Colts are banking on. Well, again, again if, if I don't think he's going to go for 1,800 yards. I just, I just don't think they're going to be that run-centric, at least with, with him, because you're going to have the quarterback, you know, knock on wood that AR stays healthy. He's going to get his, gosh, what, six, 700 yards? I don't know. Uh, he, it's not going to be Lamar Jackson-like. He's, I, he's not going to get 1,000 yards. Surely not. I wouldn't say so. I don't but, think so. But all the pieces going together, it, it's – it, it's set up for Jonathan Taylor again. You've got you add the you add the the uh, deep threat outside with Mitchell, who, who adds to Pierce and Josh Downs and, and, and Pittman, and the offensive line. When, when the offensive line was really good, Jonathan Taylor was really good. So yeah, I I, I I kind of agree with that. And again, we've talked about and I wrote about today that the team is is expecting big things because of those two players. So, so that's like I said, the uh, very obvious that uh, that he would be the choice there from Pro Football Focus. We'll talk the top three Colts. Um, Pro Football Focus named the top three players for each NFL team ahead of the 2024 season, and for Indy, they named the two obvious ones are DeForest Buckner and Quentin Nelson, uh, I think, and then the third one they named Michael Pittman Jr. as uh, as the third top Colt. I would say Jonathan Taylor is, is there. Um, and I, I think you could even you can argue at his position, Braden Smith. I think at right tackle, you can make a good argument, though that's just can not he, a sexy can, pick. Can he, so can he more? at at slot corner, I think yeah, you can you can make that too uh, for sure. Um, like w- w- when you when you value it for the position, you could you could throw Kenny in there. Um, and that's interesting. The, the first uh, Buckner and Nelson, yes. Yeah, and then I think there's argument. Yeah, there, there's good debate, mm-hmm. and and their criteria is a little bit nebulous too. Is it the best three players on the roster? Is it the three most important players on right. the team? It, it top doesn't three really, players. What right. does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. So it, it it lets you it lets you make an argument and lets people get angry in the comments, which uh, the internet is known to do. Oh, no, uh, not the internet. I know, not people the internet. always keep their minds. You on the internet. you would know better than me. I mean, you're you're the digital media specialist here. As, as he shudders, yeah, um, inward in shudder. Yes. Shutter. You, you, I, I think probably Taylor is the third best player, and you wish it was Pittman, but he, he he's not. I don't think he is yet. I mm-hmm. just don't. But but again, Pittman or uh, uh, Taylor's coming off two down seasons, right? Uh, you, so you know f- for whatever the re- and, and there were reasons, injuries and contract and all that stuff. But he needs to be number three. You know Richardson in probably next year needs to be yeah yeah. i think it's not a good thing with a team where one of your top three players is not your quarterback Mm -hmm. that's not that's not a good place to be and what about if one of your top three players is a guard how do you feel about that i know i know i know (laughs) i know and is one of the top paid offensive linemen linemen in the league that that's well that's another podcast isn't it it is it is uh it's one of those where they really really hit on a draft pick at a non-premium position. Yep. So it's good and it's bad. And it's not bad. But, uh, yeah, I don't think it's – it's not great at all to have a quarterback not on your list and a guard on your list. Yeah. You want the quarterback there. Pro Football Focus ranks Anthony Richardson the 24th quarterback uh, as a top quarterback. you got four games. you got four games. Exactly. What, what, you're going to get upset because he's not top you five? Yeah, you, I, I mean, You can't come get on. upset with that. You, you, you just can't. If you're upset with that, then you need to take a chill pill. You, you, like, you need to get a life. You need to stop listening to podcasts that are produced out of your their mom's basement and listen to us more here on the Colts Blue Zone now, podcast. Next year, he needs to be yeah, you want, you want top him there in that 14, conversation. top 13. Yep. And if he's, if he's 24 next year... This team's in trouble. Yeah, I think so. You'd be much more concerned. Um, that's a spot where, like, he's going to be there. You want temporarily. That's why they they put Marvin Harrison Jr. eleventh in receivers. Boo! Like I said, give like me, I, I, love a, Marvin, I love Marvin. I love Marvin, Marvin Jr. Jr. But boo! No, I, I think Malik Neighbors was ahead of Pittman on that do, list. Can't do it. Not played it down yet. And then right after Pitt was mm-hmm. Romo Dunze. And yeah. you, you know, you're just like, okay, sure, whatever. But these guys have done. 
uh, zero in the NFL. They haven't right. caught a, a pass yeah. in a preseason game. They yeah. haven't done anything. Where so, was Puka Nakua on that list? He was on that list. He I'm was sure. On that list. I, don't I think know he exactly was. Where. I think he was top top fifteen. But he certainly wasn't last year. No, as a and he should have been. Pick. Exactly. Nor should the other rookies. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's how it is. So. Yes, that's how it is. But th- thank PFF for giving us things to talk yeah, about. Yeah, we certainly do appreciate yeah, cause it. I'll tell you what, uh, and as we get past the next OTAs and uh, the, the veteran uh, or the, the mandatory minicamp, uh, boy, until we get to training camp up from, from the end of there, mid-June through training camp, it's uh, we're going to have to come up with some stuff to we talk will. about. We'll be talking about the top three Colts in our in our mind or the exactly three most indispensable or whatever you can yeah. come up with a lot of good things when there's nothing else to talk Dave's about. Dave's breakout players I'll I'll soup up Ashton Doolin again for for another year but I, I love Ashton I still do by the way and a uh, all pro level uh special teams player but but yeah that that didn't totally happen uh, as everyone who listens to this podcast knows but but yeah we'll still bring you some content at that point we'll we'll generate a little bit we might take a week off uh, here or there. Say uh, we did last year, and it yeah. no, no one seemed to mind. It's okay. So. Yeah, exactly. We'll 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 make it to to the start of the start of training camp and all that. Just so long as there's no serious drama, like we talked about right at the beginning of this podcast. You oh, hope you, that there continues to be no drama. Like there was something. Like I, I forget who it was. I think it was New Orleans came out and said a player, like a defensive end, uh, tore his ACL down there uh, at a Saints uh, OTA camp. Yes, so sir. so he's done for the year. Like that's well, that's that's the worst possible. Well, scenario. Somebody said they were they'll, they'll monitor when he might come back. Yeah, yeah, next year. Yeah, we'll monitor yeah, until yeah. next year. It's going to be eight months until he can yeah do anything of significant uh, physical exertion again. Well, as I as I retweeted, I mean injuries are part of the NFL and they really suck. But an off season injury during your because the Colts lost who was it Daniel Scott? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Was an ACL and it was in mm-hmm. it was it wasn't rookie minicamp I don't think but it was, it was shortly thereafter. It was close, yeah. That's what you don't want it because th- you're not doing strenuous mm-hmm. things as mm-hmm. far as you know contact, but they happen. But I saw that and I thought, man, that's just awful. So. A- another PFF thing, and I I didn't put this in in notes, but just kind of struck me as funny was they did the top. 32 tight ends in the league. Of course, you've got Brock Bowers in there in the 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 top 15. Not a single Colts player listed amongst the 32 players there. With all their tight ends. Remember when we were talking last year about their stacked tight ends? There's like 15 on the roster right now. (laughs) Exactly. But none of them are any good, apparently, according to Pro Football (laughs) Focus. According to PFF. Yeah, we'll we'll see exactly how how good they are. And and, I I think that they do have high hopes for Jelani Woods. I really do. And he didn't play last year. Exactly. Didn't play a dang down, which had to be incredibly frustrating. For, for him and for Shane Steichen as well because he's he's a unicorn. We talked about well, that leading up to the draft. you see him out there in practice. My yeah. goodness. He's just a big dude with uh, with good hands. And and I saw him like pre like I remember my first impression of him going to to Westfield was him just throwing with people pre pre practice um, in inside that uh, inside the whatever it is the facility there because he was a, initially a quarterback in college when he was recruited at Oklahoma State and then he transitioned to did he outgrow the position he must have I mean, exactly they had other guys I guess and they're like oh, let's, we got to keep this guy on the field somewhere and I just want to see uh, I, I want to see him him uncork one in the game on on just some razzle dazzle crazy play because he's got a gun man he has a gun that can absolutely uncork the ball yeah, the problem with the, the issue with the tight end room is Everybody does something sort of good, right? And, and in Jelani Woods, we don't know. I mean, it, right? He, he's he's sort of like Richardson. You, you think mm-hmm. you know, but you don't know. I think that's a good comparison. But Cotton Granson, you know, this will be a monster year for him. Drew Ogletree coming back from his offseason issues in uh, Mallory. I thought he played pretty well last mm-hmm. year. And, yes. and the guy that everybody's ready to kick. To the curb, Moali Cox. He just does things for just you. So solid, man. And, and you know, if he's not your blocker, is it is it Jelani Woods? Who, who Ogletree? Do they keep four tight ends? I don't know. It's going it's to be really, really interesting when you got. And they they want that guy. They yep. they they want. I still wonder. Maybe one of these days, Battle will tell us what happens if Brock Bowers had been there at fifteen. Mm-hmm. Do they still take the L- two because of the? Pass rush to premium position, I, right. probably, probably, but they, 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 they desperately want somebody to emerge, and I think they would 
desperately like it to be Jelani Woods. I think so too. And and you bring up bring up Mo Alley and his blocking acumen. Like Colts fans, and we have even discussed it on this podcast. Uh, have been trying to cut him on the final roster cuts out of training camp for the last and two or three happen years. Again. Exactly, it's going to. Like I can promise you right now that in a couple months we're going to be discussing this. But but the thing is. Like he is valuable to this Colts offense. It Ashton really is. Doolin. Ashton yeah. Doolin is valuable to right. this Colts, not just the offense, but mm-hmm. special teams yeah. as well. Yeah. But but when when you talk about Mo Alley Cox in particular, it goes back to what we said just a short time ago. The Colts are banking on Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson to be a dynamic duo in the run game. And who's your blocking tight end if it's go, not go Mo back Alley and Cox look at right now? The eighteen eleven season, and how many times Jack Doyle sprung JT with that. Whack, you know the the comeback block against a, a defensive end, and that's what Mo can give you. And and if someone else can do that, fine. But until they can, this team's going to want to run. What was Tyken's philosophy coming in? Uh, throw to throw to score, run to win, run to win, and run to win fourth quarter. Or so and you need blocking, and it's going to be really really interesting how they how they size up this tight end class. Yep. And uh, I'm sure we'll get into that plenty more over the coming weeks and months and when we actually get to see them on the field uh, come training camp and all that. But here's to hoping that it's a relatively uneventful next uh, couple weeks and months uh, for the Indianapolis Colts as uh, the uh, offseason program continues into OTAs. We will talk more about some players that we hear from over the next week, next week, and who knows, maybe uh, maybe another uh, OTA uh, change tweet comes out from one of those uh, NFL insiders that gets a scoop here or there, uh, meaning trying to float out another uh, possibility for what happens uh, uh, from either the owners or the players uh, this offseason. But uh, all that to say, we do appreciate list- you listening. You can follow us on Twitter at Colts Blue Zone. Mike Chappell's at mchapel 51 You can read all his work online, fox59.com, cbs4indy.com. Matt Adams at Statomatty. I'm Dave Griffiths at Dave G underscore sports. Subscribe to get us delivered to your podcast listening device as soon as we drop every week. And we will see you next week on the Colts Blue Zone podcast.